Hi, Spring fans. In the last several videos in this series of introducing Sp Spring for GraphQL and the GraphQL Java engine below it, we've pr focused primarily on queries, reads of data from the server side, but GraphQL can also support updating data. Indeed, one of the things I love most about GraphQL is that updates are so darn simple. In GraphQL, updates are only slightly different from queries, and everything you've learned so far will look very familiar. Andy Mark, founder of the GraphQL Java engine, will help us understand some of the nuances in the lower level and some of the very subtle uh, distinctions between queries and mutations. Okay, so mutations are not the first thing that, that comes to mind when people learn GraphQL, but in real life, mutations are as much important as queries because you need a system that also allows you to change data to make anything interesting. On, on the GraphQL level, mutation is actually nearly identical to a query. It's, it's more a convention than a strict technical difference. So if you, when you implement a mutation, you are allowed to have some kind of side effect. So you implement an annotated method in Spring GraphQL, a data fetcher if you uh, use directly GraphQL Java. And in this data fetcher, you are allowed to change something to have some kind of other side effect, for example, updated database. But this is not in any way enforced by GraphQL Java or Spring GraphQL. It's really something that you have to follow when you implement um, mutation. Technically, the other very small difference um, uh, from mutation to a query is if you have multiple queries, like top level fields, root fields in a, in a request, the spec requires you, or re not requires you, the spec requires that each mutation is finished before the second or third end mutation is started. So it forces a serial execution compared to a query where if you query the user and the company and the product at the same time, everything will be run in parallel if possible, but mutations are forced to run in SQL. Now, of course, there are some subtle things to know beyond the order of execution when dealing with the Spring for GraphQL engine. Rossen Stoyanchev, lead of the Spring for GraphQL Java project, can help illuminate some of those details. So for mutations, uh, the at argument annotated method parameters where uh, we take the input uh, from the GraphQL request and we uh, map it onto an object, bind it onto an object structure uh, becomes even more important because the input data is going to be uh, the data that needs to be uh, persisted or saved somewhere. And um, we support um, the use of uh, data binding actually for uh, taking what is essentially a map uh, you can think of it as a json map um, input and then binding that onto the object structure uh, that's declared this input to the controller method um, this works with constructor argument injection uh, but it also works with uh, data binding um, to properties of the target object um, and it's also supported at nested levels uh, so if you're loading an object which contains other objects uh, within it um, as long as the input data contains all of that um, we will go through uh, spring graphql will go through and create uh, the necessary object structure for you and in addition, um, uh, which is also pretty essential for working with input data, is that you can use the at valid annotation uh, on all the um, argument annotated uh, method parameters and uh, the, the uh, standard bean validation will be applied uh, to, to, those, to those objects. Right, that's pretty cool, huh? Okay, I guess we just need to kind of see it in action. So let's dive right into it. In the installments thus far, we've looked at how to read data. And I expect that's going to be a very common scenario, right? And in fact, that's one of the strong suits uh, of GraphQL is that ability to uh, 
uh, add a little bit of indirection between the representation of the data that the client consumes and the uh, storage of the data, you know, the ultimate storage, the ultimate representation of the data as it lives in its uh, in, in storage, right? That ability to create whatever view of the data is super, super convenient. But you still need to change that data on occasion, and right? And here, GraphQL is also really, really powerful because it is so consistent and so succinct in the way that allows you to do that. There's only one way to change things on the server side. And when I say change, I mean, whenever you do something that updates or inserts or in any way modifies anything at all, it's just called a mutation. There's no arguments here about whether it's post or put, whether you should return HTTP 201 or HTTP 200 or HTTP 202, uh, whether you should return a location header. None of that matters anymore. It just goes out the window and allows you to focus on getting your code up and running in production quickly. Okay, so let's go ahead and build a new endpoint here called Mutations, a new service. We're going to use, as always, Spring Boot 2.7 RC1. We're going to use the Reactive Web support and we're going to use the GraphQL support. Uh, this is, by the way, Spring GraphQL here is 2.701 uh, RC1. That means it's nearly 2.70 GA. So if you're watching this in the far-flung future, then just know any version of Spring Boot after 2.70 uh, should have a GA-supported GraphQL integration that you can use. Okay, let's go ahead and hit generate. And we're just going to open this up, as always, in our IDE. First things first, we need to create some schema. So as always, I'm going to create a new directory. GraphQL. I'm going to call this uh, mutations.graphqls. Uh, and here we're going to have some types first, and obviously we're going to have our query to read data. So we're going to say customer by ID, ID, ID returns a customer. But we're also going to have a type for updates, right, called mutation. This is yet another well known type that all GraphQL projects are likely to have. So for read operations, they're going to probably live more often than not statistically uh, in the query type. There is one uh, alternative. There's something called a subscription. But for now, just think query, okay? But for writes, there's only one place. It's called a mutation. And um, so we're going to create a mutation here to write, uh, you know, so let's add customer. Let's call that, okay? Uh, name, string, and the return value is a customer. Now, if this looks familiar, well, it should, right? That's the nice thing here. The definition of fields for up updates are exactly the same as the definition of fields for reads. So we're gonna add a customer. It's gonna take a parameter and return a customer. Um, and uh, we're gonna represent that here. Now, we need to actually uh, implement these types. Uh, oh, I need, a, I need to actually have the type definition for customer, don't I? So type customer, and let's just call it ID ID name string okay we'll go here and we can say at controller class mutations controller and we're going to have a method here to return you know customer customer by id integer id we're going to create a record customer integer id string name and query mapping and this will be an argument and our job is to return a particular customer by its ID. So let's uh, create a little map, a little in-memory dictionary here of data. data. We'll call this our little in-memory database, all right? And um, it'll be a map of ID to customer, okay? And we, we're gonna need a way to get that data. So let's finish this, return this.db.get ID. Pretty trivial. Now, what about Right. Well, here we use mutation mapping. So customer insert, uh, and we're going to say the argument is named name, and we're going to create an ID. So we need not like let's say an atomic integer or something. Uh, integer IDs, new atomic integer, goody. All right, and uh, this dot ID dot increment and get for value new customer ID and then uh, the name yeah so name 
and uh, this dot db dot put id value good, and then just return the value. We've written after a fashion our data to our quote unquote database. Don't let the lack of video here stop you per from perceiving my air quotes. Okay, so I've used mutation mapping to do that work. Okay, so and again I could use at schema mapping where the type name is equal to mutation and the field is equal to insert or add customer in this case, right? I could I could do that. But semantically that is the same as this. This mutation mapping declaration. So we'll leave it as is. All right, let's go ahead and uh, start this up. Yeah, so we've got our atomic integer, our database. We've got the ability to read some data and then the ability to update it. Let's go ahead and start up and see what happens. Oh, I think we forgot to enable GraphQL, graphical, the uh, console. Yeah, I did. I, I always forget that. Okay, restart. Alrighty, good. So local host graphical, good. Re refresh query, good. Customer ID. If I ask for the first ID, the first record, nothing's going to come back. In fact, I'll get a null, right? So I need to actually do a mutation first. Add customer whose name is uh, Spring. You know what people are on the Spring team. Um, Yu Shin. And that'll return a value. So I have to de define what fields I want from the value. There you go. Okay. Uh, and, and then uh, Olga, there you go. So if I now want to read the data, I can say customer ID is equal to one. Oops, ID and ID name and voila. Okay. There we go. So customer ID one, what about two, etc. So that mutation allows us to change things. And again, it's, you know, in a world where the only constant is change, having a very concise, very specific, very clear, very easy to understand way to change things, I think is a big, big deal.